Well, thank you very, very much. It's a delight for me to be here. I've enjoyed uh, questions that I've received this afternoon, and this has been a very, very productive. Um, earlier studies of the commons focused on small to medium-sized common pool resources that we did and many others did, uh, but many of the very early were of particular resources by people writing from a particular discipline without comparison and without any theoretical foundation. Uh, but as we uh, looked at those uh, studies and did some empirical work, um, we were able to uh, get a good sense of how small and medium-sized common pool resources were managed by common property institution. Now, uh, it turns out, uh, especially after 2009, there's considerable interest in our research related to small, medium, large, and global environmental systems. And um, researchers and citizens and officials uh, are asking for some kind of a framework that puts people and societies together. So, uh, putting people and ecologies together, uh, we can think of them as social ecological systems. Um, it turns out that is difficult to achieve. Um, uh, the um, most uh, academic teams do not share resources across disciplines. So that as you're trying to study these things, um, uh, I'm now working with a bunch of ecologists studying forest resources, and I, uh, I had to learn what DBH meant, which is diameter breast height, and how to measure it, and a variety of other technical um, things, because we are measuring the condition of the forests in a scientifically very careful way, uh, besides uh, looking at the social systems and how they are organized. Um, the, um, what we need to uh, have is a common framework of language that will enable us uh, to uh, develop sustain help develop sustainable systems and uh, achieve uh, a sustainability of diverse commons. Okay, so what are some of the challenges that we face in achieving sustainability? Well, the first one that I'll talk about uh, shortly is overcoming what I call the panacea trap. A second one is developing multidisciplinary, multi-tier framework for analyzing uh, sustainable SESs that people across disciplines can use. Uh, we need to be building better theories uh, for explaining uh, and predicting behavior. Um, we need to find ways of collecting data over time, but we've got to learn which variables we need to be studying in a consistent way to have very good overtime studies. Uh, and we need to understand design principles and why they work. Uh, this is a very big agenda. Um, they all point us to the importance of institutional diversity. Uh, but tonight, I'll only be able to provide an overview of these, but I'll be very glad uh, if people want to pursue one or another of them in questions uh, to do so. Uh, so challenge one, as I mentioned, is the panacea problem. A uh, very large number of uh, policymakers and policy um, uh, articles talk about the best way of doing something. Um, uh, for many purposes, if the market wasn't the best way, people used to think that it meant that government was the best way. And um, we need to get away from thinking about uh, very broad terms uh, that uh, don't give us the specific detail that is needed to really know what we're talking about. Um, the, um, uh, we need that uh, to recognize the governance systems that actually have worked in practice fit the diversity of ecological conditions that exist in a fishery or our irrigation or a pasture, as well as the social systems, so that there's huge diversity out there and governance systems at work have to fit it. So what we found is that government and private and uh, community uh, mechanisms all work in some settings. People want to make me argue that community is always the best, uh, and I won't step into that trap. Uh, there are certainly very strong places where people can self-organize, but it's not the best, just like government isn't the best or the market is not the best. 
And challenge two, uh, one of the things that we need to be working on is a multidisciplinary, multiple tier framework um, for um, analyzing um, uh, uh, social ecological systems. Um, and what we've done is we have analyzed uh, four, identified four very large encompassing variables uh, that are at what we call a focal level uh, that generate uh, together an action situation uh, and a market, uh, when we talk about market relationships between buyers and sellers, we're looking at an action situation. Um, and that level, that focal level, uh, is affected by and <coughs> affects larger and smaller ecosystems, as well as larger and smaller social, economic, and political systems. So let's look at the first tier of that framework. Um, we can think broadly of a resource system um, uh, and a governance system. Uh, uh, both of them set conditions for subparts. So a resource system sets um, of, uh, sets conditions for an action situation, but um, we can think of action um, resource units as part of that. So when we talk about um, a forest, uh, part of the resource units are trees. If we talk about a fishery, uh, resource units are fish. Uh, they differ dramatically in their characteristics, um, but both are what are frequently being harvested um, we can also think of a wide diversity of actors who are participating in one or another of the action situations that affect uh, the long-term sustainability of that system. Uh, this is a very broad framework. I'm going to unpack it in a few minutes, but um, it is now uh, being used by a number of people for current studies. So how does a framework help us build and test better theories? That's the third challenge that uh, we're facing. And the important thing is it helps identify multiple variables that potentially affect the structure of action situations, the resulting interactions, and the outcomes. Um, and so uh, a framework is one way that we can study similar systems that share some variables in common. Um, but uh, don't share all or uh, look at quite different systems. It avoids people overgeneralizing, uh, as we've had in our literature, that all resources should be privately owned or government owned. If you read Garrett Hardin's in 78, that is his conclusion. Uh, and in many textbooks, uh, the Hardin argument is repeated. Uh, there's also a problem of overspecification meaning my case is different than yours, and uh, uh, refusing that there are lessons that one can learn from studying multiple cases. Uh, so to diagnose why some social ecological systems uh, are, do self-organize in the first place and are robust, we need to study similar systems over time and to examine which variables are the same and which differ so that we can understand why some are robust and succeed and others fail. So part of our need is to beyond looking at the first tier is beginning to develop the language more thoroughly by going to an initial second tier of variables. Um, the, um, many of the second tier have third and fourth. Uh, I'm not going to get down to that level tonight. Um, but we are working on that diagnostic framework further. Uh, you can see an early version in PNAS in 2007, uh, a much later version in um, science in 2009, and uh, Mike McGinnis and I are currently working on a paper um, that is looking at it. Now, I'm gonna warn you, when people see this for the very first time, there's kind of a reaction of, <gasps> So prepare yourself, this looks very complex. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, but you start thinking about what is involved in thinking about a resource system, well, you need to know what sector you're talking about. 
um, and um, you need to know um, the um, um, you need to know uh, how c clear the boundaries are. Uh, you need to know uh, how big it is, uh, what kind of human constructed facilities there are. Um, similarly, if you're going to talk about a governance system, uh, we're talking about government organizations, um, on, on what kind of non-governmental organizations are there, um, the um, um, various kinds of property rights systems, uh, all of those things are very important. Uh, then attributes of the resource units uh, in terms of the difference between fish that move independently, water that also moves but moves in channels versus trees that don't move. Um, and then what is important about the kind of actors involved, uh, how many are there, what kind of social economic um, attributes do they have, what's their history of use, uh, where do they exist in similar location to where the resource is or far away? Uh, what kind of leadership is there, etc.? Now, um, part of the um, problem is how people see this and think that we're proposing that any time you do a study of a single resource or, or several comparative, you need to study all of these. No. This is a broad framework, just like when you learn economic theory about certain aspects, you don't need to look at all of the variables in an economic theory for any of the questions you're going to look at. You need to learn how to pick out. Um, and, um, but these give us a sense of some of the variables that have been identified repeatedly as being affecting whether people are able to uh, govern a resource and uh, uh, do so sustainably. Uh, and uh, so uh, they're useful for that purpose. Um, and I'll, I'll mention a special issue that we're developing that you can look at this more broadly. Now, we can address three broad questions with that framework. The first one, what patterns of interactions and outcomes, you know, how much overuse is there or is there? What kind of conflict there is or isn't? Uh, whether the system collapses or doesn't. Uh, all of these are likely from using one set of rules for the governance system uh, relating to particular kinds of resource systems as units and uh, particular kinds of actors. In other words, uh, one of the important questions we've learned is we need to be studying which rules generate sustainable outcomes for particular kinds of resources and how do we distinguish resources. Um, and what we've learned is that the rules that are used in regard to grasslands and pastoral institutions um, uh, generate overuse and collapse. Uh, we need to understand which ones do that and why, uh, and which generate adaptive resources. And uh, we need a framework uh, of that sort to develop good research and good theories as we move along. Now, the second type of question is, for a particular resource in a particular setting, what is the likely endogenous development of different governance arrangements, use patterns, outcomes? Uh, and we've been studying irrigation systems around the world, forestry resources around the world. I just finished a paper with an Indian colleague looking at lakes in Bangalore, an urban area, uh, and uh, comparing uh, them as to their, uh, how they are sustainable or not. Many of them are not. Um, and uh, when do we not expect the local people to be able to develop their own rules so that uh, when do we need to worry that this is one of the places that we need to impose rules because locals are not going to do it. Um, it's comparing when they're not going to or when they are able to develop well tailored rules of their own and how do we predict that. The third type of question is how robust and sustainable is a particular configuration of users, um, and resource units and governance, so looking at long-term sustainability, um, and what kind of disturbances are we potentially going to see and do we need to worry about in regulating them. 
So all three of these are part of a very long-term, very big research program, uh, but all of them uh, are uh, enhanced by having a common framework. Okay, now let's go back to the challenges that we're talking about. Um, and uh, the fourth one uh, is looking at comparable overtime data for testing theories. And uh, this is, again, another place where a uh, uh, challenge in terms of doing research is exacerbated by very tall disciplinary rules and uh, walls in terms of language. Uh, people do studies, and uh, the study is very hard for someone in a dis different discipline to um, understand. So we need this common taxonomy of core variables uh, in the SES framework that will help us build more empirical research that we can all study. Um, we've had a huge number of individual case studies, um, but uh, not as much accumulation of scientific knowledge as we need. Uh, so we need a huge number because we see such variation out there. The uh, if, if the variation is only one or two types, you don't need a large number of studies. But when you find uh, over a hundred different combination of variables as we have, uh, you need large, uh, large studies. Okay, so one of the initial things that uh, we have been doing over time um, was to study these. We developed a database uh, early. Uh, where we coded uh, a lot of information about irrigation systems of fisheries. I thought I was going to be able to um, um, uh, uh, develop a series of statistical analysis, uh, but found out that I had to move up in my level of uh, generality um, and um, look at um, uh, a broader way of thinking about instead of the details of a boundary rule, did they have one? Or the details of uh, collective choice mechanisms that they might use, did they have the right to make their own rules, et cetera. Um, back in the 18, uh, 1980s, uh, I was struggling on a sabbatical um, with uh, Reinhard Zelton and others uh, to uh, find the statistical relations, and I developed a series um, of what was more general than the specific rules, having failed at finding uh, the specific rules that were always successful. And um, I called them design principles. I, uh, at times, I think I should have called them something else because people confuse that as ways that you give those to people who are thinking of designing something from the beginning rather than using it for looking at uh, a study of robustness. Uh, but we, we designed them. I uh, presented them uh, uh, in the 1990 book, Governing the Commons. Uh, they're talked about in great detail. I'm very pleased to report um, that uh, Cox, Arnold, and Villamoyor have finished a very interesting article published uh, in December 2010, where they uh, searched the literature for people who had overtly studied whether or not the design principles uh, characterized studies that they were looking at. So people had done studies and then looked at whether or not they were successful or not and whether the design principles uh, were helpful in doing that. They looked at over 90 studies um, and they did find very strong empirical resource, uh, uh, support, very strong. Um, and then they have suggested a better way of framing than I did originally. Uh, for example, when I talked about boundary rules, I did not make a distinction uh, between a clear set of boundaries of the resource and a clear set of boundaries for the users. And uh, sometimes uh, systems have one and not the other, and in some of the case studies that were reported, that was a problem. So they um, crafted um, uh, a little bit clarified uh, uh, three of the uh, design principles. Um, they distinguish in terms of boundaries uh, between clear boundaries of the resource users, who is a member, and uh, looking at clear boundaries of the resource itself. 
So uh, hopefully they, we will use that in our future work. Um, uh, a second design principle is congruence with local and environmental uh, conditions. Um, and I'm uh, talking about the distribution of benefits and costs uh, to uh, social structure. And I did not distinguish between the social part and the uh, ecological part. They have. Uh, and then in terms of, of monitoring, um, they uh, distinguish monitoring of the resource conditions as well as monitoring of user actions. Besides the boundaries and congruence and monitoring, uh, I also talked about graduated sanctions, conflict resolution mechanisms, uh, recognition of the right to make their own rules, and uh, if it was a larger system, was it nested? Uh, they found very strong support for all these and no need to uh, distinguish them over time. Well, now part of the question is, why do they work? Why do they enhance institutional robustness? And um, we've been thinking of more micro uh, foundations of why they do work. One, that those who are participants in a system that does use the design principles over time is that they have uh, operational rules that are being followed by others because there's monitored. Um, a second reason is that those who are most no knowledgeable about the effects of what's going to happen are the ones who are making the rules. Um, a third is uh, that resolves conflicts before they escalate. Uh, a fourth is that a diversity of governance units uh, trying to solve a fishery or irrigation or other resource problems stimulates learning and increased performance over time. And as you study these things over time, you see people passing information about how they're doing and why it's working. And both large and small units back each other up. So uh, that is one of the uh, important set of uh, learnings from our research. Uh, in general, then, what have we learned? Well, uh, the attributes of the users uh, that are conducive to their self-organizing and managing a resource is that they do, research, they do view the resource as highly salient. Um, uh, they then usually have a relatively low discount rate in terms of the uh, benefits obtained from the resource. Um, over time, they've developed uh, high levels of trust and reciprocity. Um, uh, uh, fourth, they have autonomy to determine at least some of their own rules. Uh, they're nested in complementary multiple-tier systems. Uh, usually, uh, in these kinds of settings, they have prior organizational experience. They've developed social capital and local leaders who are able to take on the very tough job of being leaders, and they share some common understanding about uh, the resource. So that the, uh, these we're finding as we're doing even more studies of uh, robust systems, uh, these are the attributes that we're finding in systems uh, that are sustainable. Uh, we're finding that the rules devised by self-organizing regimes differ in important ways from a lot of our current textbook remedies. Um, an awful lot of uh, the recommendation for uh, regulating fisheries, if it isn't government, it is uh, ITQ, individual transferable quantity. And uh, that the key thing is regulating the quantity. Um, and what we find in a lot of self-managed fisheries, they regulate the time when you can go and fish, they regulate the space of where it's uh, appropriate to harvest and the technology that should be used. Um, and uh, so that they're actually using different attributes than we have in our literature. Uh, many of the rules that people develop or their methods of interrelationship uh, encourage growth of trust and reciprocity. And they tend to rely on unique aspects of a local resource and the local culture. What we do find is that larger regimes can facilitate local self-organization uh, so that we're not thinking about little tiny units uh, self-organizing without any relationship to larger units. 
uh, and they can, uh, very large units can be very important in providing accurate scientific information, um, and especially if they provide that in a way that they interact. Um, as I talked a little bit earlier about groundwater basin, um, our National uh, United States Geologic Survey has done some very important research uh, that then helps local people figure out the boundaries of their resource. Uh, they can provide conflict uh, resolution uh, arenas. And so court systems provided by larger jurisdictions are very important uh, for helping resolve basic conflicts. Um, uh, larger jurisdictions can provide technical assistance that's effective if they view the local users as partners as opposed to being uh, presumed that, oh, all they have to do is uh, tell these locals who don't know very much what they're going to do. Um, but if there's some respect for the local user, uh, some of the technical information provided by larger units can be very helpful, and uh, they can provide mechanisms for backing up monitoring and uh, uh, sanctioning efforts. Now, we've also looked at larger units uh, that are donor-assisted uh, large units, which you have, uh, we've all um, um, uh, supported through um, uh, USAID and uh, development assistant agencies of one kind or another, and we've done a really major study of them, uh, produced a book called Samaritan's Dilemma. Uh, what we've found is, tragically, they do not have a good foundation based on either theoretical or empirical knowledge. Uh, they fr frequently uh, encourage a na national government, well, give the resources back to local people, but uh, the resources have been taken away, degraded, and then uh, given back in a one hour, two hour meeting. I've been to some of those. Uh, and it's rather incredible that uh, they bring people into a hall. They say, now you own X. Give them a little bit of uh, uh, a background of what they must do as being responsible, and then walk away. Um, and um, uh, frequently in these kinds of, uh, um, of facilities, uh, uh, the governments retain ownership so that you're not passing on, you're just passing on the management, but they expect users to perform rapidly uh, what government agencies have not been able to do for ages. So uh, there's a very grim history out there in terms of donor-assisted uh, handover projects. One of the things that we have uh, repeatedly found is the importance of what we call polycentric systems. And this is uh, uh, important systems that exist at multiple levels with some autonomy at each level. So if we think about um, uh, a, um, a region where there is a government agency responsible for the region, but there's a lot of local autonomy for management resources in that region. Um, the, uh, if, the, um, if we create a polycentric system like that, it retains many of the benefits of local level systems because there are people at a local level making decisions about any of the rules, but it adds overlapping units to help monitor performance, obtain reliable information, and cope with large-scale resources. So that uh, one of the important things is that frequently we need that. Um, uh, we can later, if people want to ask some questions about <clears throat> global change, I argue very strongly for the need for polycentric institutions uh, to cope with climate change. Okay, so I've given you a fair, a very rapid overview of a huge amount of research. Let me, um, oh, okay, I, I should have, I forgot a, a uh, slide, sorry. Um, so what? <laughs> um, one of the things that we have found in our large-scale studies now, much to the, uh, the surprise of many people, is that local monitoring is one of the most important factors affecting resource conditions. Uh, we now have studies in PNAS and science on our forestry studies. Uh, where nobody is thinking that local users will be important monitors, uh, but we ask about it because we found that so important in many studies. And um, the, um, uh, that local people pay attention to what's happening in the forest if they have some rights to collect. 
They are in the forest from time to time. Uh, and monitoring is not very expensive. If you have to hire government officials to be the official monitors, that's very expensive. And frequently, it's hard to pay them very much. Uh, and so you have some problems of corruption uh, because you have local monitors who are not being paid very much. Okay, let me then go back to the last one. I wanted. What we're doing now is we're working uh, with colleagues um, on the SES framework. Uh, we keep uh, fine-tuning it, uh, getting it better defined, uh, et cetera. And there'll be a special issue sometime this year or the very beginning of next year in the Journal of Ecology and Society that reports on an update and about 10 case studies, uh, very, I shouldn't say case studies, 10 studies that use it. Um, we're then working very hard on getting definitions of key terms done. Uh, we're working on how this affects theory and the development of theories uh, that can be uh, developed. Uh, we're studying forest, water resources, and fisheries over time. And what we're trying to do is study which propositions hold in regard to diverse resources at diverse scales. So that gives you a very fast overview. Um, I hope I stayed within my time limit. Uh, it's time for questions and discussions. I'm going to go back and sit, but I will be glad to take uh, questions. <laughs>